John Henry, Chairman of the Committee for the Republic. Tonight's talk is with uh, Jeff Sachs. Jeff graduated a, a few years behind me at Harvard College and went on to become one of the most celebrated economists of our generation. Jeff is the perfect person to explain how the dollar reserve fiat currency silences political debate over the trillion and a half dollars we spend annually on our imperial infrastructure and military adventures abroad. Jeff is passionate uh, in his opposition to our war in Ukraine. I asked him uh, earlier why, and then it'll be, you'll find that very interesting. Uh, indulge me for a moment in an act of political and, uh, why don't we call it, historical imagination. Let's imagine for a moment that we lived in an American republic rather than an American empire. And let's imagine that Congress did its job uh, as it did more than a century ago when we had the greatest legislature in the history of the world. Our foreign policy then operated inside, not outside the Constitution. Separation of powers was live and well. Congress, and bear with me here, let's imagine that Congress exercised its exclusive constitutional power to declare a war. Let's imagine that Congress, rather than the committee, uh, invited Jeff here, Jeff Sachs, to testify on whether to provide Ukraine with massive military assistance. Here's what the debate would sound like. And I'm going to paraphrase, uh, paraphrase the, uh, the, the greatest uh, uh, the deciders of the 19th century. Uh, Kentucky Senator Henry Clay insists on United States neutrality. Clay proclaims, we must never forsake our wise policy of peace except in self-defense. Far better it is for us in the cause of liberty that we keep our lamp burning brightly on our shores as a light to all nations than to hazard its utter extinction on a cross of counterfeit national security. Then, Massachusetts Congressman John Quincy Adams, who uh, entered the White House after his presidency, and entered, uh, uh, he entered the House of Representatives, right, it, which is in the Congress. After his presidency came back, he was in the Senate, president, then he came back to the House, because Congress was where the decisions were made. Adams said, quote, I am opposed to the United States becoming a co-belligerent or belligerent except in response to aggression on our sovereignty that has already broken the peace. We have a spear and a shield, but the motto on our shield is freedom, independence, and peace. We dare not go abroad in search of monsters to destroy our national glory would plunge from liberty to force, from the march of the mind to the march of the foot soldier. Now, Illinois Congressman Abraham Lincoln denies that the war in Ukraine warrants the United States abandoning neutrality. Lincoln underscores that we're the safest nation in the history of the world in the following quote. At what point shall we expect, Lincoln said, the approach of danger? Shall we expect some military giant to step the ocean and crush us at a blow? Never. All the armies of Europe, Asia, and Africa combined with the treasure of the earth in their military chest, with a Bonaparte as commander, could not by force take a drink from the Ohio or make a track on the Blue Ridge in a trial of a thousand years. If danger ever reaches us, it must spring among us. It cannot come from abroad. If destruction be our lot, we must ourselves be its author. As a nation of free men, we must live through all time or die by suicide. Okay, and last but not least, Massachusetts Senator Daniel Webster, uh, Webster thunders like a hammer on an anvil, and I quote him. Invincible self-defense and influence abroad by example is the Constitution's foreign policy unless disturbed by an act of Congress. I ask unanimous consent to approve a joint resolution demanding the fi filing of articles of impeachment against President Joe Biden for making the United States a co-belligerent with Ukraine in its war against Russia. 
and I quote, quote. Okay, the good dream is over. Uh, back to reality. We are subjects of an empire, not citizens of a republic. Impeachment is off the table. The only choice we have is between a Democratic and a Republican Caesar. Jeff Sachs isn't called to testify before Congress. Jeff, you win the consolation prize. I ask you to join me in welcoming Jeff Sachs tonight to the Committee for the Republic. So, <laughs> good, yes. Let's, let's pretend you're in Congress now. And so we thought we'd try this interview format to start with. And uh, Jeff, why don't you, you're, you're very passionate about uh, in your opposition to the Ukraine war. Can you kind of uh, explain that and, and, and kind of take us through each of the steps that you think got us to where we are today? And, and that, I mean, <clears throat> we can start as early and, NATO as you want, going through 208, 214, and so forth. First, uh, thanks, uh, thanks for having me uh, this evening. And uh, that wonderful uh, quotation of Abraham Lincoln uh, reminded me of a cartoon that some of you may have seen of um, Uncle Sam, of Uncle Sam with the uh, missiles uh, pouring out of his vest and weapons everywhere, and he's on a psychiatrist's couch. And S Sigmund Freud is behind him, uh, and uh, Uncle Sam says, uh, I've got 6,000 nuclear weapons. I've got the biggest army. I spend more than uh, 10 times uh, than the next 10 countries combined, and I'm still afraid. What is it, Doc? And he says, you have a military-industrial complex. Uh, <laughs> so... <laughs> It, it seems to me that this is uh, what what this is uh, what this is about. Um, it's interesting. We're not. It's not that we're butting into a Russia-Ukraine war. There would never have been a war but for us. So we created the war. It's not that we're intervening in someone else's war in an unwise way. We made the war. And we made the war very clearly, very obviously. For me, it goes back 35 years, actually, because I was involved in the end days of the Soviet Union and the early days of the post-communist governments in Eastern Europe and in, in the former Soviet Union. And I knew Gorbachev and Yeltsin President Kuchma of Ukraine, and so on. There was no idea at the time other than we just want to be normal. We've gotten past the 75 years of this nightmare. We're in trouble. Uh, we've got a financial crisis. We're broke. We've got a broken economy. But we want to just be normal. This is what Yeltsin said to me, to my face, many times. Uh, President Gorbachev, in my mind, was a truly great, decent statesman who just wanted to end this terrible period. And we could not take yes for an answer. Uh, we could not accept the idea of peace and normalcy. And I had a little glimpse of it as a, as an econ as a young economist. I knew I knew something about financial crises and how to end them, uh, and I had had some success in doing that in, in some other countries. So the government of Poland in 1989 asked me to come and help, and I said. By the way, I can't really help. Lech Wałęsa is my hero. You know, he's under house arrest, so I can't really help you. But uh, if anything changes, let me know. And uh, literally, the guy from the embassy uh, called me back in 30 days. Well, we're about to sign an agreement to uh, um, 
legalize solidarity and, and so forth. So I arrived in Poland in April 4th, 1989, and said I would advise the government and solidarity together about this debt crisis. I won't belabor the whole point, but in those days, everything I recommended about how to overcome the financial crisis was adopted by the U.S. government immediately. It was actually, I was a kid, and it was a little impressive for me. Uh, I didn't, one day I called up uh, Bob Dole, Senator Dole, who was the majority leader in uh, September 1989, and I said, they really need some foreign exchange reserves to stabilize the currency. They need a billion dollars. And I had typed up literally one page proposal that morning. Could I come to see you, Senator? And he said, come in. It was 9 a.m. and I showed it to him. He said, okay, do you think this is right? And I said, it is. He said, could you come back in an hour? I came back in an hour and who was there? General Scowcroft. Yes, not bad. Uh, so I explained, General Scowcroft said, what, what do you have in mind, Professor Sachs? And I gave him the page, and he looked at it, he said, do you think this will work? And I said, this will stabilize their currency. And uh, they, Senator Dole let me out of the room and said, call back in the evening. And uh, at 5 o'clock, I called Senator again, he said, uh, tell your friends uh, that they have their billion dollars. It was from morning till night, from 8 a.m. typing up something till 5 p.m. getting the billion dollars for what became called the Currency Stabilization Fund. The reason I mention it is fast forward a couple of years when the Russian economy was in a similar state of collapse and I made a similar recommendation. And they said, are you crazy? And I said, but it worked there. And uh, Larry Eagleburger said, Jeff, just as a friend, you don't have a chance. And I'm a little stubborn, so I didn't believe him. And I didn't have a chance. I didn't really understand why, because I was giving good advice. And the advice had actually proven itself two years before, so it wasn't hypothetical. But everything we did for Poland, which was a lot, canceled debts, standstill on debt repayments, emergency stabilization, things I made a list of, um, none of it was done with Russia. And I couldn't really understand because I was the same advisor and it had actually demonstrated itself as a little naive. But OK, I was watching geopolitics at work. One side, this is us. The other side is the enemy. So the idea from the beginning was, we don't want normalcy. We want control. We won. We won the Cold War. Now we're going to do whatever we need to do. And that involves starting the NATO enlargement as well. As everybody here knows, James Baker III, our Secretary of State, promised in absolutely unequivocal terms to Gorbachev, not one inch eastward for NATO. That's not a myth. That's not a lie. There's some books and papers that say, oh, we didn't really mean it that way and so forth. We meant it that way, believe me. It was for German reunification. It was unambiguous. NATO was not going to move. We weren't going to take advantage, which Gorbachev kept saying, that's very important, very important. He didn't get it in writing. And the moment I was in the room, by the way, the day, the moment the Soviet Union ended in the Kremlin, it was very weird, but Boris Yeltsin walked across the room from a back door, sat in front of me because I was leading a delegation of economists, and he said, gentlemen, because it was all gentlemen, uh, I can tell you the Soviet Union has just ended. Uh, because in the room over there, I met with the generals of the, the uh, Soviet military, and they've agreed to the dissolution of the Soviet Union. So uh, that was uh, something I heard uh, across the table. Um, and I said, I'm going to help you get some financial support so that this can become, uh, you know, we can make some headway on this. And of course, I failed completely. 
But they were told no NATO enlargement. But by that moment, from that moment onward, the White House started planning what became the project for the new American century and everything else that NATO would start to enlarge and we would, uh, we would fill in uh, whatever uh, the Soviet Union had exited. And we know now from 1992 onward the planning started and then Clinton, who was not our most consequential uh, thinker, uh, or strategist uh, kind of rolled with it and uh, uh, agreed with the NATO enlargement. And we know how many diplomats, uh, senior diplomats in the U.S. were aghast at this, not only because it was a direct violation of what we promised, but it was completely provocative. And our most senior historian statesman, George Kennan, famously said, well, this is absolutely wrong. It's going to start us on the path of a new Cold War. We know that Brzezinski uh, in 1997 said the key to all of this is Ukraine and already in 1997 NATO enlargement to Ukraine was on high on the agenda and Brzezinski spelled it out in an article in Foreign Affairs called a Eurasian strategy and he said that we'll start with Central Europe then we'll go to Eastern Europe, then we'll go to Ukraine, and Ukraine will join NATO between 2005 and 2010. And um, it was all quite explicit, and Brzezinski explained, Ukraine is the geographic pivot of Eurasia, so if we can surround Russia and the Black Sea, they s cease being a great power. Uh, this was uh, all spelled out very, very clearly. And this is the genesis of everything that, that has happened. Many other things happened that aggravated this tremendously. And We were speaking beforehand. In my view, 2002, the unilateral U.S. withdrawal from the ABM Treaty was a disaster because it put Russia even more on edge that the U.S. was uh, unilaterally uh, aiming for a... Uh, whether first strike advantage or a decisive nuclear advantage, but uh, another violation of uh, trust in a context where NATO was already enlarging. Remember in 1999, NATO enlargement started with Hungary, Poland, Czech Republic, and then in 2004, uh, Bush added seven more countries, which was a lot because it was three Baltic states, uh, Latvia, Lithuania, Estonia, Bulgaria, Romania, Slovakia, and Slovenia. So it's already up to 10 instead of one inch eastward. And then uh, Putin made a very strong appeal in the Munich Security Conference in 2007 saying, don't do anything more. Stop already. Uh, and he expels it out. You lied. You promised. Not an inch. Now we've got 10. You've got to stop this. And of course, the response of the White House always uh, with the fine he ear listening on the ground. And by the way, we know that Bill Burns sent a famous memo that uh, WikiLeaks uh, picked up and released for us to read the Niet means Niet memo, which said it's not just Putin, it's the entire Russian political class that is dead set against an expansion of NATO to Ukraine, perfectly understandably, in my view. But 2008, the Bucharest NATO summit, uh, Bush pushes NATO's commitment to expand uh, to Ukraine and to Georgia. If you look, and I don't mean Atlanta, Georgia, I mean Tbilisi, Georgia. And if you look at the map, that's a little far from the North Atlantic, by the way, as a defense against a country that doesn't even exist anymore. So it's Brzezinski's plan, which spelled out, which was spelled out very clearly. We're going to surround Russia in the Black Sea. And that was, I was called by European leaders in 2008 saying, what the hell is your president doing? 
so provocative, you know, pushing us. But Europe never says no, basically, when the U.S. pushes hard enough. And so this got inscribed into NATO doctrine in 2008. And then Yanukovych won the election in 2009. And Yanukovych, very cleverly, was saying, I'm, we're in between two giants. We need to be careful. And Yanukovych said, we don't want NATO. We want neutrality. Thank you. And this, of course, was absolutely the only thing that can save Ukraine from U.S. relentless insistence on NATO enlargement. And so Yanukovych became the enemy of U.S. policy. And that meant making whatever effort was needed eventually to overthrow Yanukovych. And we happened, thanks to the Russian government, happened to uh, be able to listen to uh, such a nice, interesting conversation of Victoria Newland and uh, Jeffrey Piat. Uh, Newland at the time was not in her current position as undersecretary. She was uh, in the position as Assistant Secretary for European Affairs, and she plotted who would be the next post-Yanukovych government in a call intercepted at the end of January, um, about uh, three weeks before the overthrow. And she said it had to be Yatsenuk as the next one, uh, and, and spelled out why, and sure enough, Yatsenuk became uh, the next prime minister uh, in uh, another U.S. regime change operation. That did not sit well with the Russians. If you add in all of these events, now you're at war. And indeed, the first thing that Putin did, and I think it's very important to understand, Russia was making no territorial demands of Ukraine at all before 2014. All Russia had done was say, we want a long-term lease of Sevastopol, of the naval base, to 2042. That was the full extent of it. But then, okay, to stop a naval base that was Russia's naval base since 1783 falling into NATO hands, uh, <laughs> Putin said, okay, we take back Crimea. Thank you very much. And... This began the next phase. So when you read our history, by the way, quote, our history is according to the New York Times or the Washington Post or whatever other fantasy news you want, it always starts with, then he took Crimea. It doesn't start with Yanukovych's overthrow, which is, and by the way, I happen to see, weirdly enough, some of the American engagement in the overthrow close up. I won't go into that now. We could talk about it later. But yeah, that was an American regime change operation. So then came Crimea. Then came the Donbass. And Putin pushed for Minsk 1, then Minsk 2, which not only was sane for autonomy for the Russian-speaking regions of eastern Ukraine, but it was voted 15 to nothing by the UN Security Council. And we know that the U.S. view was, don't worry about it. You don't have to do that. And so we told the Ukrainians, okay, you signed it. Don't worry. You just keep going ahead to reclaim uh, the eastern Donbass and all of the good advice came, no, Ukraine should be a unitary state. We don't want federalism. We don't want uh, autonomy. We don't want a treaty that uh, has been signed, sealed, and confirmed by 15 to nothing of the Security Council. So that didn't sit very well. And thousands of people died in eastern Ukraine in the years up to 2021. Then comes Biden. And 
everything gets worse, actually. Uh, strangely enough, because Biden basically doubles down on all of this. And one thing that's interesting for me in the 2014 call of Newland and Piat, Biden shows up in that call that he's going to do an attaboy to confirm the new government and make everybody happy. So he's already part of this story from 2014, the regime change and the, uh, the, the coup, because Newland says, I'm talking to Sullivan. He's got his boss involved. Everything will be fine. So this is a story that goes back quite a ways. And for me, the last chance to head off war was in December 2021, Putin puts on the table an absolutely plausible document, a Russia-U.S. security agreement draft, and says we need to negotiate over this. And the core of it is two things. The core of it is no more NATO enlargement, and we are going to discuss missile placements in Eastern Europe. Those are the two things. I thought both of those are pretty damn reasonable, actually. So I called the White House. Last time they would talk to me, last time uh, that uh, I've had any direct interchange. But I had a long talk, uh, not with the president, but with senior advisor, that why don't you negotiate this and head off a war? Oh, don't worry, don't worry, there won't be a war. I said, I think you should negotiate this. This is serious, this is real. Well, we know that in January 2022, the U.S. gave a formal response. NATO enlargement is none of your business. That's formal NATO doctrine, by the way, that no third country has any interest at all and any right to have an interest between NATO and a prospective member. How absurd can this be? But that is the absurdity that we operate under. And it's very interesting to read the minutes of the Russian Security Council meeting of February 21st, 2022, which is online where President Putin calls on each of the senior officials to come up to date, and he calls on Lavrov, and Lavrov says, we have a formal response from the Americans that there's nothing to negotiate, that we've made no progress, there's absolutely no prospect of any negotiation at all. So then the special military operation starts on the 24th. And ladies and gentlemen, it's really important to remember, before February 2014, no territorial demands. Then Crimea, but no territorial demands over the Donbass. As late as January 2022, all that Russia was asking for was the Minsk II agreement to be implemented. That we said no. Then, in February, the Duma recognizes the independence of Lugansk and Donetsk. So that's the next step. Not annexation, which comes in September. And what was the point of the special military operation? As we say, oh, it was to conquer Ukraine. No. The point absolutely clearly was to get Ukraine to negotiate neutrality, which Zelensky said three days afterwards on February 27th, okay, we could talk about neutrality. And in early March, negotiations actually begin. And in fact, I know the backstory to it because I've been briefed in detail of the backstory by many of the participants. But Ukraine, that was the last sane moment of the leadership. 
They said, we can have neutrality. And uh, the Russians said, can you put something in writing? They put something in writing. It went to Putin. Uh, President Putin said, okay, put this into a draft. And they started negotiating with the with the Turkey as a mediator uh, in Ankara. And I went to Ankara to uh, talk to the mediators at length about this. And this nearly reached an agreement about to be signed. Also, Naftali Bennett explained that in a long, weird interview that he gave, a five-hour interview. But he spelled this out. And as it was explained to me by many of the parties in this, one day the Ukrainians come and say, we're no more negotiation. And we know now that that's because the Americans stepped in and said, no, we will not back you to negotiate neutrality because the whole project was NATO enlargement. That's the project. And so we stopped the agreement at the end of March, said, we have your back, don't worry about it. The economic sanctions will do them in. Crush the economy. You'll get HIMARS, you'll get the weapons. He'll never mobilize. All of this fantasy. To me, the whole thing from 1992 onward is a poker game where we have a lousy hand and we keep raising the ante. And so we never agreed for a moment to negotiate once in more than 30 years. And we led Ukraine to disaster, proving, I think, uh, Henry Kissinger's greatest adage, which we all know, which is that to be an enemy of the United States is dangerous, but to be a friend is fatal. Uh, and, uh, and, and I think that this is uh, Ukraine. They're a friend of the United States, so they're about to be completely destroyed as a friend of the United States. And this is what friendship means. So now, you know, we're, now they understand that all of their fantasies about Ukraine winning on the battlefield and driving Russia out and so forth, it's probably 500,000 Ukrainians dead by now. And now today I heard, I haven't heard the details of women in the trenches now because women are being drafted. I don't know whether that's right. I just saw a short uh, um, note about this. But they're, aside from the fact that we can't even stock their artillery, as we know, they've run out of people. They really have run out of people. And we're at a complete dead end, and this administration is obviously incapable of one moment of real foreign policy or diplomacy. And as far as I know, I don't think uh, Biden has spoken to Putin for one moment since February 24th, 2022. There is no diplomacy. And they have no strategy and no plan except to completely, totally wreck Ukraine. And that's where we are today. Jeff, I have a question. Um, and that is, you know, NATO enlargement uh, requires uh, a treaty amendment that the Senate has to confirm by a two-thirds vote. Uh, did you ever think about asking any senator to call a hearing and have you express doubts about voting uh, in these additional NATO members. And then the second one related is also when the Soviet Union dissolved, uh, making NATO at least superfluous, if it wasn't superfluous at the start, has anyone thought the way in which you can convince Russia that we're not antagonistic is at least for the United States to leave NATO, which can be done by a congressional enactment, which happened in 1798, statutes supersede treaties. Was that ever on the agenda? I don't know about you, and I don't, I'm, I don't live in Washington, um, <laughs> and I don't want to brag about it too much. Um, <laughs> but but um, I haven't heard a moment of sane debate about any of this in Congress. And 
I tried to reach out to senators that I know, and they wouldn't even talk to me about this for the last two years. So I don't see any, any attempt, not in the Democrats at all, and the only one I know who is sane about this uh, is Rand Paul, who tries to generate a debate and can't get a debate because no one wants to talk about this. So I don't know of any hearings. I, have, I write a lot about this. I speak about it. I know a lot of congressmen and senators, and nobody wants to talk. One, actually, there's one that, that, uh, that corresponds with me. His main interest, in my view, is that he wants to continue, he just wants to know if NATO doesn't expand, can we still sell weapons? That seems to be his main concern. Uh, I think there really is, there really is the idea that we got a lot of business to do. Uh, I don't think it's a small thing, actually, for some part of this Congress. You know, you notice that uh, Mike Rogers plays his role with each speaker, uh, making sure that uh, they understand the concerns of uh, the Armed Services Committee and so forth. So there's business here. That it, and and when we heard Biden's uh, obscene, excuse me, uh, talk a couple of weeks ago, he made sure that we understand that the Patriots are produced in Arizona, and this one's produced here, and this one's produced here, and this one's produced here. So that's part of it. But I've not heard any of that discussion, and I don't recall. I was you know on the economics beat, so they weren't asking me. But I don't recall anyone proposing. Uh, that we would pull out of NATO. Uh, what was on the table was that NATO wouldn't enlarge, uh, and that was a real issue as late as 1995 because we know that uh, Bill Perry uh, was uh, aghast when uh, Madeleine Albright and uh, Richard Holbrook started to stuff this down the defense secretary's throat and and Perry's saying, but we're just starting to make some normal relations with the Russians. And he was completely stuffed. And he said, says in his memoirs that, you know, he thought about resigning. He didn't know whether to resign or not. So that was the last debate about this that, that I know. It's not incidental that the enlarged NATO committee was headed by uh, Lockheed, uh, uh, the the chief lobbyist to uh, organize the, the committee. So this has been a game for a long time. Biden's been part of that game from, from the start. There's a, a video, which you may have seen, of him in 1997 saying, NATO enlargement's fine. Now, now we shouldn't go all the way to the Baltics because that may make uh, the Russians upset. Uh, but um, he was very much for NATO enlargement uh, at the beginning because he's been part of, uh, definitely part of the MIC for his whole career. So I don't know of any serious foreign policy debate on anything in Congress. I mean, I just haven't seen any foreign policy debate on any single issue of any substance for years. Congress is, is dead on this. So where does it? Where do you think Ukraine's going? What, what what's gonna? Uh, do you have a? I know it's just a crystal ball, but what what do you think's gonna happen? R Russia has a, a a very significant military advantage now, obviously, and they're going to continue fighting until Biden picks up the phone and says, uh, "Okay, I get the point. NATO's not going to enlarge," and then. If that ever happens, then there's actually going to be some kind of agreement reached. Until then, Russia's just going to keep uh, advancing and uh, killing a lot of Ukrainians, uh, possibly taking Odessa. Uh, I don't know, but you know, there's no nothing that's going to stop Russia uh, from this because, from the Russian point of view, every day they hear that NATO is still intending to do this. So they can't stop. There's not going to be a ceasefire on this basis. This is a war over an issue. This is, this is a classic von Clausewitz 
point that this is politics with other means. And the politics here is about the United States and Russia and security. That's what this is about. And the United States won't acknowledge that most basic truth. And because of that, the war will continue and Russia will continue to expand and Ukraine will continue to bleed massively. And Biden, I don't know if he's functional anymore, but somebody needs to call Putin to explain, okay, it was a bad idea. We've stopped. And I keep offering my Zoom if they want to Zoom. They don't know how to make a phone call. They can use my phone. They can use my Zoom account. But they've got to make a call to explain. We want to save some part of Ukraine. We want to stop the mass killing and the mass dying. And we understand that there was a real issue behind this. And that they haven't acknowledged to this day. Now, Jeff, could I ask you, suppose that the United States told Ukraine, you know, we're out of here. Um, it's your business. That is, our military weapons cease uh, and tell them it's up to you to decide whether you want to fight. You think that would bring Zelensky to the table? That I, we're the only one that, uh, by our co-belligerency in providing this massive aid, is keeping the war alive? Look, all wars have to be fed from the outside. Uh, and so Ukraine cannot fight this war for two days longer if we say that. That whether Zelensky says it or whether there's a coup or whether whatever, whether, you know, uh, who knows? I don't want us to be part of that. But if we said it, the war's over. Same with Israel, by the way. If we said it, the war's over. They can't fight this on their own. This is very clear. It's just mechanical. So, of course, we should have told them back in March, thank God you're signing an agreement. We told them the opposite. And, and oh, my God, as bad as we are, the British are worse. <laughs> They're insane. They really think this is the second Crimean War. They all think they're Palmerston. It's unbelievable. So David Cameron comes back as the foreign secretary. What's the first thing he does the first day is fly to Kiev? He, yesterday, it's unbelievable to say we have your back. They can't even defend London, much less Kiev. They have nothing. But they love the, they love the glory of the Crimean War. And that's the first thing they do with all the problems they have. With an economy in crisis, they can't keep the National Health Service going. They can't do anything right now. But the first day he goes to Ukraine. So this is how far we are from reality. Yeah. Now, you remember during the Vietnam War, we had this idea, the domino theory of somehow Vietnam went communist, the whole world would go communist, and democracy would be over. Um, I was saying that during the Vietnam War, we had this domino theory. I guess it started in the 50s with Dien Bien Phu, that if Vietnam ever went communist, the whole world would go communist. All the credibility of the United States would be crushed, uh, and it would be the end of the free world. Now, it's been said in Ukraine, the same, that if we aren't there to defend Ukraine and Putin gets anything out of it, that is the end of any democracy in the entire world, uh, and everything will go to heck in a handbasket. It's the same thing that Anthony Eden said about Nasser in 56 when we kicked Britain and France and Israel out of Suez. He was a little bit wrong, more than a little bit wrong. So what is your view as to whether or not this really is a, the turning point whether democracy survives or not, which is kind of the, the rallying cry of Joe Biden? Well, look, I think there are two things uh, that make this all a complete fantasy. One is... The idea that this war started as an unprovoked war of Putin invading Ukraine. I just spent, uh, I, I hope, uh, a useful period to explain it's the opposite of that. There would never have been a war but for us. So how are we saving anything if we cause the war? The whole idea is crazy. 
We made this war. <laughs> we made it over a 30-year period, but it accelerated from 2002, 2008, 2014, 2021. We made this. So, no, there's no spillover in that way other than perhaps some sanity. But the second thing that's even worse, and we have grown-ups in this city, grown-ups by physical age, saying literally the reason we need to fight is to show China how strong we are. <laughs> oh, Xi Jinping is shaking in his boots from this. <laughs> oh, you saw how afraid he was yesterday. This is actually, and by the way, Naftali Bennett, in that explanation when he was describing how he was an informal mediator, and he said, we were on the seventh draft and it was about to be signed, and then the U.S. stopped it. He says, they stopped it. And he says, he explains, you cannot make this up, ladies and gentlemen. Bennett says, you know, I'm... Look, I'm Prime Minister of Israel. I don't get into that. I, you know, I can't judge. But they thought they had to do it to show China. This is insane. No, really. This is not proving anything to China. It's not, it's the opposite. It's just showing weirdness, weakening any capacity the U.S. has in in a literal sense of running out of stockpiles, running out of, uh, uh, of, of uh, weapons. We don't even have 155 millimeter shells anymore. Uh, now we have another uh, war in, uh, in the Middle East that we're tending to. The whole idea that we're proving something in Ukraine, well, they should have thought about that before they raised the ante five times with the losing hand. That's all I can say. So, shall we get into uh, uh, the war now in, in Israel, Palestine? Um, what, is, what are your views on that? I, yeah. I ask him what his views are on the current uh, war against Hamas with Israel and our... We've, we've moved from being a, a co-belligerent to a belligerent now without a declaration of war. What do you, what do you, what do you make about that? You know, just in, in shorthand, I think we should start, uh, we're uh, November 16th, so it's, uh, I think, uh, six weeks ago that Jake Sullivan said the Middle East is the quietest that it's been in two decades. <laughs> and uh, poor Jake, not only did he say it, he wrote it in the uh, November-December issue of Foreign Affairs, which arrived uh, about a week ago. Uh, and there it is in bold print. The uh, Middle East is the quietest that it's been in 20 years. And actually, in the text it says, and we've resolved the problems in Gaza. So if ever you want really a vivid demonstration of how they are completely out of touch with reality. It could not have been made more vivid. And if you go back to an enormous amount of evidence, the evidence of the seething discontent in Gaza, a.k.a. the world's largest open-air prison, could have been noted very easily. Everybody knew it. But the idea of the United States was, in the usual way, we make the reality we want. And so we'll make peace between Israel and the uh, kingdom of Saudi Arabia and leave the Palestinian issue aside. Another fantasy, by the way, completely. No way that was going to happen, period. No way. But they cannot listen to anybody. This is really a serious problem of American foreign policy, which is you only show your strength by proving that you're deaf. 
Because if you listen to someone else, that's appeasement to even hear them. And so this whole thing is, in my view, a terrible blunder. It's very hard to have a two-state solution right now, but it's the only solution, by the way. Absolutely. I started, I went to Israel my first time in 1972. And so 50 years ago, this uh, 50 year, 51 years ago, and already the famous alone plan was being implemented, and it was explained to me that we'll put settlers in all the key places in the West Bank, and this will put facts on the ground. And they were so proud, I remember in 1972, about facts on the ground, facts on the ground. I probably heard it 20 times in that trip. Okay, you put facts on the ground long enough, you make such a mess for yourself that you've destroyed any chance of peace. But even so, without going into a long story, we've had innumerable war resolutions in the Security Council and the General Assembly, innumerable statements by the Arab League, innumerable statements by the Organization of Islamic Cooperation for a two-state solution, which I favor. I don't, you know, it's harder now. I wish there weren't 600,000 settlers uh, in the West Bank and East Jerusalem. Now, the Israelis won't have it, not this government, so I want to impose it. How can it be imposed? It can be imposed by the UN Security Council, which under Chapter 7 has the authority to keep the global peace and can put sanctions and other measures on uh, for those who violate Security Council. There's only one country standing between a two-state solution and the current disaster, and that's the United States. The only one. Because if you count the votes in the world of the 193 UN member states, it's actually 191 to 2 right now. And even in the United States, what we're discovering, and the politicians are shocked by it, and the university administrators are shocked by it, is the younger generation is not on board with this unqualified, unconditional support of Israel. Quite the contrary. So this country is really divided, and it's divided generationally. And it's divided by other reasons. But Israel has made, a, I mean, Netanyahu is a disaster from beginning to end. He should have resigned October 7th and taken responsibility for what was a massive security failure. They were warned. The Egyptians tried to warn them. He's a disaster. So he has to go. Maybe some Israelis would say, okay, we accept we have to do something different. I don't know. But to my mind, this has nothing to do with Israel-Palestine negotiations. Because Israel and Palestine have tried to negotiate, or they haven't tried, but they've negotiated for 50 years. And hardliners on both sides have blown it up for 50 years. And now the hardliners are in government in Israel, so it's worse. And every day, the statements that are coming out of the Israeli cabinet are tantamount to intent to genocide, as many people are pointing out, because the vulgarity of it is absolutely shocking. And interestingly, even this administration, where they're, the politicians are trained, you can't show even a glimmer of space with Israel, are saying, okay, we need a Palestinian state. They're saying it, because you cannot resist truth. In this context, which is so glaring, and the whole world is calling for Israel to stop the carnage. So my view is, my own view is that the UN Security Council needs to vote this, and if it's 14 to 1 with the U.S. vetoing it, the next month it'll be 15 to 0, because we can't resist being the only one standing 
in front of even what we say is needed. We signed all those resolutions for a two-state solution. Biden said it again two days ago. So I want to impose that as an answer and stop the war. What's interesting is Hamas, Hezbollah, all of it can be demobilized and disarmed in the context of a political settlement. That's the point. There is no reason for a war over this. All this war is about, to refer to von Clausewitz again, is to avoid a Palestinian state. That is not a reason to have a war. So, so that's my feeling. So so basically the, the political reality is that the we the two the two that really count, the two countries that really count, Israel and us in terms of deciding whether this war goes on, uh, there's no political restraint here on Israel. And there's no politi- there's nothing but vengeance in Israel now, and, and so the it's, more it's the not, more Palestinians yep. uh, BB kills, the the popular he is. So so we have no restraint in either country, which are going to decide how long this goes on. So where does this li- where, you know we're going to have a salon uh, in uh, December twentieth uh, on uh, we'll have a whole salon on this, but but by then. How many? What we're over? What twenty thousand? Twenty to one now? Uh, we're 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 in a month from now. Uh, what are we going to have? Fifty thousand? I mean, there's seven million Palestinians. Uh, how how many are they going to kill? I mean, you know, we we did this with the American Indians. We said no good Indian is a only good dead Indian is a dead Indian, and and, and they're doing they're doing this. Uh, there seems to be no political restraint. What Israel is doing is not vengeance, it's politics. They are trying to rule out any political settlement other than domination. That's the policy. And the policy has several different routes to it, but one root of this policy is that there really are people who believe the book of Joshua, period. There really are. Interesting to read the book of Joshua, by the way, because the book of Joshua promises the land from the Euphrates to the Mediterranean. That's a long way, by the way. God help us if anyone tries that. So this is a real problem and the real solution in the interest of Israel's survival is to impose a stop to this period. If you like Israel, impose an end to this now, because we're going to have 191 countries completely, completely opposed. And this country is is going to be absolutely majority anti-Israel within a month. And already the opinion poll yesterday showed that if asked, do you side with the United uh, with Israel or should we be neutral in this? I don't remember exactly the words in the in yesterday's poll. I think it's Reuters Ipsos poll was thirty two percent side with Israel and forty one percent neutral or neutral mediator or something like that. I'm paraphrasing, so I may have it not quite, but it was a huge shift from just four weeks ago. You cannot watch. Hospitals being bombed, thousands of people being killed, and not have a change of politics of the public. Of course, we don't have any public input to foreign policy, usually. That's what happened in this country. We're completely without any explanation or public input to foreign policy. But the public is enraged. And the campuses, by the way, are really enraged. And now the professors are walking out together with the students. So give another week, another two weeks. It's going to change here, too. This is dreadful. It's horrible what's happening and horrible for Israel what's happening. So the faster... This solution is imposed on those who cannot do it internally, the faster it's going to be 
better for them too. That's why I am trying in every discussion I have in New York with diplomats to emphasize this point. It's not whether if you're for Israel, then do it even faster to, to impose a solution because what's happening right now is complete destruction of Israel by Netanyahu. Jeff, why, if the opinion is that intense, uh, because there is standing of any country in the world to sue, at the present, Israel and the United States for genocide in Gaza. Uh, the International Court of Justice said that a nation has standing even if it's not the target of the genocide. Uh, there are no lawsuits there. It's coming. Don't uh, worry. It's the coming. The second, second observation, would you agree with Ben-Gurion's observation? This is uh, at the... This is decades ago, and he said, uh, if I were Arab, I would never sign a, a treaty with Israel. You know, we stole their land. Uh, we said that God wanted us to have it, but that it's not their God. Uh, and so what do you expect? Uh, that they are rejecting the idea that we stole their land. And that's Ben-Gurion's characterization of what the source of the problem was. Do you agree with that? Well, what, what Ben-Gurion said, which was interesting, was we should settle for this partition. We'll come back later if, uh, for, for more, uh, but take what we can get, be pragmatic. Uh, and, but already part of the idea was, you know, all of this land, uh, at least for some of them, was uh, going uh, to be uh, for Israel. I don't know. Uh, there's a, but he characterized it as stealing their land. Look, I think at this point we had better save the world by enforcing a settlement of two countries right now. And I would recognize Palestine tomorrow. I would, I think the big, mis I mean, the thing that can't work is to say we enter a new negotiation. That's baloney because we've been 56 years talking about this since the Six Day War. No more negotiation. Everything that can be said has been said a hundred times. There's nothing more to say. What should be done, in my view, tomorrow is the UN Security Council votes the state of Palestine and the UN General Assembly by a vote of 191 to 2, maybe, votes the state of Palestine as a UN member state. And it's a UN member state with its capital in East Jerusalem and control over the Islamic holy sites. And if you get that done, there will be peace. And the Arab countries have said repeatedly, we want normal relations with Israel. Since 2002, they've said, just have a Palestinian state and we have normal relations and security for all parties. And that's the yes. And they said it again in Riyadh just a few days ago, exactly the same thing. So this, to my mind, is the right answer. So, Jeff, you have two uh, things that uh, I want to make sure that you have a chance to talk about tonight. And we'll open it up. The one is uh, uh, the, the, <clears throat> uh, the reserve currency so and the fiat currency and, and the fact that uh, we were basically able to finance all this uh, massive, you know, trillion and a half dollars a year without tax increases, and so it makes the it it it, it silences the political debate. Uh, you, as an economist, you have uh, you, you can describe that, but th this is something that we keep coming back to. Um, so, could you speak to that? Uh, Very basically, uh, the U.S. public debt, as you know has risen from 35% of GDP in the year 2000. This is the debt owed to the public, not including the debt owned by the Federal Reserve. From 35% of GDP in 2000 to 98% of GDP now. And the Congressional Budget Office has a technical projection which says on current policies, how will this evolve? And the answer is it reaches 190% of GDP by 2052. I have the number slightly uh, uh, unsure, but it's 182% or 190%. Uh, 
In other words, we're on a completely unstable, uh, unacceptable policy. The reason is that um, we don't fund spending, and we haven't funded these wars uh, since 9-11. Uh, so there have been at least $5 trillion uh, direct costs of the wars and arguably 7 or $8 trillion costs of the wars, not any of which was paid by anything. We don't like taxes in this country. We grew up uh, with uh, John Locke's philosophy uh, put into the Constitution by James uh, Madison, uh, and the idea was uh, protect rich people from having to pay taxes. Okay, uh, so we don't pay taxes. We spend a lot of money. The debt is soaring, and no one wants to do much about it at all. But for a long time, interest rates were near zero, so it looked to be free. Now, you know that that would end when leading economists explain that it will continue forever. So uh, Larry Summers uh, and Jason Furman wrote an article in 2018 or 2019 why interest rates would remain low for the next generation, basically. And that was the signal that it was over. Um, and, and, uh, and, and indeed, uh, it's over. So we're now in a high interest rate environment and probably a rising real interest rate environment. The international uh, role of the dollar definitely facilitated the lower costs of borrowing. That is the exorbitant privilege of the dollar that uh, de Gaulle talked about in the early 1960s. If you are the reserve currency, it means that other countries hold your foreign exchange reserves as their forex reserves. It means that uh, private uh, actors hold your dollars. It means that your $100 bills uh, are widely used and so forth. And it's not, by the way, the, the dollar is maybe uh, the currency of settlement for 60 or 65 percent of transactions. It's not 100 percent of transactions by any means, but it's, it's held at a high level. It's coming to an end, and it's coming to an end for two, for actually three reasons. One is that it was based on an extraordinarily large role of the U.S. economy in the world from 1945. That was very unusual, but we were not only the last one standing in 1945, we were the one that had developed a massive, uh, a massive uh, economy during the war, undamaged except for one day, December 7th, 1941. Other than that, it was all building. Um, and so we were... <laughs> We, we, were, we were the creditor, and we were dominant and technologically dominant, and it was an extraordinarily unusual situation. And gradually, gradually, it faded away, and with the rise of China in the last 40 years, that accelerated the, the, the normal rebalancing of the world. So that's one reason that it's diminishing. A second reason that it's diminishing is that it is based on the U.S. banking system and SWIFT payments and so forth. And the banking system is not going to be the center of payment settlements mechanically in the future because we're moving to digital settlements of all kinds, including central bank digital currencies. So even that mechanism is going away. But then there's a third factor which has accelerated everything. If you want others to use your currency, my advice is don't confiscate their money. And the U.S. doesn't get that. So we keep taking other people's dollars away. This is a bad idea. And we do it as a habit because the president can do it on his own by a signature. So we took $300 billion of Russian assets and seized them. And we have, I think Larry Summers is one of them, and 
Financial Times and others, oh, we should not only freeze that, but take all of that. It's unbelievable to me. We're the country of John Locke, supposedly. There's supposed to be private property and rule of law and whatever. Okay, we don't accept any, we don't believe any of that. And in fact, oh, you're a Russian. And you probably know Putin. Okay, we're going to take your apartment. We're going to take your boat. We're going to take your bank account. We're doing this, of course. It's unbelievably stupid. But we're doing that with Venezuela. We decided one day, this was one of our genius foreign policy acts, oh, Maduro, you're no longer president. Mm, we like Guaido, you're president now. And so you had foreign exchange reserves. Well, you don't have them anymore, Mr. Guaido. Now you have the foreign exchange reserves. And we did it with Afghanistan on the way out. And we do it with Iran. Okay. They're getting the idea, maybe we shouldn't leave our money in dollars. And that has accelerated tremendously with the BRICS. So the BRICS already, when there were five, Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa, they were already larger than the G7. And they completely get the idea, dollars is not the best bet. Now there are six more in the BRICS. Argentina, Egypt, Ethiopia, Saudi Arabia, United Arab Emirates, and Iran. The BRICS measured in purchasing power adjusted prices for output constitute 37% of world economy and the United and the G7 30%. And the BRICS have decided in their last meeting okay, we're going to non-dollar payments. And why not? And they will, by the way, because I used to invent new monies uh, for a living. Uh, the Estonian kroon and, and uh, the uh, uh, Slovene tolar. And I can tell you, you can make a new money. It takes about a weekend, actually. Uh, you have to know a little bit of monetary economics, but you can do that. There are you don't need dollars to make real economy transactions. So they'll move out of the dollar. So this is going to accelerate. And it means, from every point of view, we'll face more and more of the balance of payments constraints that all other countries face. Higher interest rates, uh, less uh, ease of uh, borrowing. And, and it doesn't help that we shut down the government or try to shut down the government every other week. Uh, so we keep getting our credit ratings knocked down also. And we don't like taxes in this country under any circumstances. Ladies and gentlemen, I know this is a group that also doesn't like taxes, but actually you can't live without taxes. Uh, we have to pay our bills, and we're actually not going to end Social Security, and we're not going to end Medicare, and so on. I don't think we should, but if you do, it's not going to happen also. And so we have to actually pay our bills in the end. And we don't like that. So our debt is soaring. It's not good for us. Add in another, why don't we have a war with China? That seems to be popular in this town. We could really get the debt boosted uh, to uh, oblivion uh, very quickly. All of this means that this is a rapidly obsolescing bargain, this uh, borrowing uh, on the cheap. It's gone. Uh, it doesn't exist anymore. Uh, and so uh, it's, it's going to require us to actually think about things as a society that we do want to do and don't want to do. One of the things we shouldn't want to do is to have 800 overseas military bases uh, in 80 countries. This is the most ridiculous, provocative, dangerous, ineffectual uh, policy of all. I think we have 173 countries who have special forces. That's yeah. why they appear in Mali and Niger and Chad and yeah. other. But I wanted to observe that, you know, the president is able to freeze all this money, engage in theft, because the Congress, again, they passed the International Emergency Economic Powers Act. Yeah. It doesn't define economic emergency. The president says whatever he wants it to Absolutely. mean. Absolutely. I mean, and I got involved in one situation where he froze the first he froze the $7 billion in the Afghan Central Bank account. 
Then, he, and, and he says that the reason that it was the emergency was because of the humanitarian crisis in Afghanistan. <laughs> then, at, in the same order, he says... Caused said, by seizing <laughs> their bank balances. Yeah, right. <laughs> then, then he says that he's, he's setting aside half of the seven billion to pay the creditors, judgment creditors, of the Taliban. Okay? You were leaving them a three and a half billion dollar debt, the Taliban, which is, remains on the terrorist list. But again, it, I, I trace it back. The Congress, again, has given away the store. Absolutely. The president does whatever he wants. Absolutely. Their Congress plays no role at all in foreign policy, at all. And so there's no discussion, no debate, no understanding, and no care at all. Everything, right. by the way, absolutely, I guarantee you, President Xi faces a lot more political deliberation, dialogue, and restraint than Joe Biden. So when Joe Biden says, that's a dictator, I'll tell you. If you look at how China really works, it's a lot more deliberation, a lot more people involved, a, a lot more restraint, a lot more collaborative policy making. This policy is made, we don't know exactly who makes it, uh, but it uh, is absolutely not made in public and it has nothing to do with congress and they don't give a damn for some reason that they it's in the constitution that they have that's why we have a parliament after all was to stop the princes from doing this kind of damage that was the whole history of parliamentarism uh, was uh, that you don't get to do wars by stroke of a pen and that's what we're doing Jeff, we, we, we've got to get, the, uh, get you to talk about the pandemic because you have uh, unique, uh, unique uh, uh, things to say. Can you describe, uh, we talked about it, if you can summarize how you got into this whole issue of the virus and the role of the military and Fauci and uh, NIH in the, in the, in the COVID-19 uh, story. Yeah, one fun story after another. Uh, but basically, uh, I have been involved from the financial side in financing uh, the fight against uh, epidemic diseases for the last quarter century and uh, worked. I designed, uh, actually, or first recommended some of the programs here, PEPFAR and the President's Malaria Initiative and so forth were ideas that I proposed because I like to fight uh, diseases uh, so that they don't kill people. Uh, and uh, when COVID broke out, because of that record, I was asked by the British medical journal, The Lancet, which has a tradition of having kind of blue ribbon commissions on uh, important public health topics uh, to chair a commission on COVID-19. And I said that I would do so mainly to look at what should the response be, financial issues of the vaccine, and so forth. And one of the task forces that I created as part of this commission was on the origin of the virus. So it was one of the 10 commissions, not uh, one of the 10 task forces. And um, the long and the short of it is I got incredibly steeply involved in the arcana of the debate of where the virus came from. And uh, to cut to the chase, the virus overwhelmingly likely came out of a lab uh, rather than out of nature and probably out of a U.S. lab, uh, but a U.S. lab working with the Wuhan. Uh, because we had very extensive work together uh, between uh, U.S. laboratories, especially NIH in-house, University of North Carolina, and Rocky Mountain Laboratory. And there was a lot of untoward and dangerous work underway. And just to tell you, ladies and gentlemen, at the beginning, I believe the nature story uh, because uh, an early article appeared uh, called The Proximal Origins of SARS-CoV-2 
in Nature Medicine in March 2020, and I read it. I said, well, these are all famed virologists and makes sense to me, so it's nature. Uh, and they said, irrefutably cannot have come from a lab. That paper is scientific fraud, nothing less than fraud. Not a mistake, fraud. And the reason it's fraud is that the authors knew as they wrote that they could not make those conclusions. They didn't necessarily know where it came from or whether it was natural or lab, but they could not have said the things that they said absolutely 100%. And so we know now because of Freedom of Information Act release of their emails that they knew it too. And the paper even today has not yet been retracted. But the long and the short of it is the following. Just uh, I know many people know this story. It took me a long time to understand it uh, forensically by being uh, tutored by a lot of uh, scientists and who helped me through uh, this uh, literature. Basically, when SARS-1 came in 2003-04 in Hong Kong, it died out on its own. And the reason that it did was that it was not so infectious. It was a beta coronavirus that wasn't so infectious. There was a long incubation period till infection. By the time a person was infectious, they had symptoms galore. So isolating people was enough to drive what we call the basic reproduction number below one. And the epidemic killed a couple thousand people. I don't remember the number, but it stopped. This virus is highly contagious, as everybody knows, and it has a short incubation period, and it has a asymptomatic infectious period, which is quite unusual. So the third or fourth day after the original Wuhan virus infection, you might not show symptoms, but you're already shedding virus and infectious. Now, why? The big difference of SARS-1 and SARS-CoV-2 is a piece of the virus called the furin cleavage site. And it is four amino acids, which help to split the spike protein so that it can enter the cell. That furin cleavage site was already tested in 2005 as something that would make a beta coronavirus more infectious. So it was already understood. And the, a real genius at North Carolina who's in Fauci's shop named Ralph Barrick already in 2005 said, you know, this is not bad for bio, quote, defense. You know what that means. Uh, because it has these properties. So this idea of the furin cleavage site was already in focus of research almost 20 years ago. Now, fast forward, Barrick developed a lot of very sophisticated technology that enabled him to do the, that enables him and Wuhan to do the following. You know there are 30,000 base pairs in SARS-CoV-2, the nucleic acids which define the genome, which define the virus. They are letters, A, G, C, G, and so on, of, of the uh, bases of this uh, RNA. Now, Barrick, who's very clever, if you give him not a virus, but you give him 30,000 letters, he will make a live virus from that. That's quite a trick, actually. That's not easy. Knowing the sequence doesn't mean that you can make a virus, but he created, over the last 10 years, something called the reverse genetic system. That's his term for it. To go from the letters to the actual live infectious virus. Then he developed something called a consensus virus. Very interesting. Which is if you have 10 of these beta coronaviruses, 
they'll differ in some of their nucleic acids, nucleotides. But what he would do is like stretch them out on an Excel spreadsheet and take the, each letter in each place that appears the most across the 10. And he called that a consensus virus. So he would make a new virus that never appeared in nature that's the consensus of the 10 that were collected. Very clever. The world's leading expert on beta coronaviruses. So he, from 2000, and he was in Fauci's shop, vaccines, this, that, all sorts of things. But especially gain-of-function research, because he wanted to test which of these viruses would really be infectious. How would it work? What if you have a furin cleavage site? What if you don't have a furin cleavage site? What if you have this piece, that piece? That's what he could do with his system. Who did he train? Shi Zheng Li. The bat lady is the expression, the one that heads Wuhan Institute of Virology, studied under Barrick. And EcoHealth Alliance is an umbrella uh, uh, funding body which funds these different units. So yours truly, me, I, who did I appoint to head my task force? The head of EcoHealth Alliance. I said, this guy must know. Of course, what he knew was exactly what not to tell me uh, and not to tell the rest, which was how much of this work was going on. That took a lot of uh, tutoring of me by outsiders to explain, you know, you, you really did put the fox in charge of the hen house. You have to understand what's really going on, which was explained to me. So fast forward, in 2017, a research proposal was made called the Diffuse Project under EcoHealth Alliance, and it was a proposal to the Defense Department, to DARPA. And it was a partnership of University of North Carolina and Wuhan Institute of Virology. And the idea, there are lots of ideas in it. You can find it online because a whistleblower posted it online. That's the only reason we have it. But it says on page 10 that we have 180 previously unreported SARS-like viruses. These are beta coronaviruses from bats. And on page 11, it says, we're going to test these for furin cleavage sites. And when there aren't furin cleavage sites, we're going to stick them in to see what happens. So there, is, there are hundreds of beta coronaviruses that have been collected from bats. But there's only one ever that has a furin cleavage site. That is SARS-CoV-2. So it appeared somehow, strangely enough. Well, it was the furious target of research is how it appeared. And in 2019, it seems very likely, not for sure, one of two things. One, that it was developed in the United States, tested in the U.S., and then sent to Wuhan because they have a bat collection to see whether it would infect those bats because we don't have the same bats in captivity. But we tested it because of the academic stray paper that by Barrick and the head of Rocky Mountain Lab, which is an NIH unit, that showed a certain Wuhan virus couldn't infect Egyptian fruit bats. Do you care? Well, that's the bat that they have in Rocky Mountain Lab, but they, that's not the bats that is most of relevant. We need the bats in Yunnan province. So one hypothesis is that the virus was made in Rocky Mountain Lab, and it was sent on a piece of filter paper to Wuhan to test with their bats in captivity to see how infectious it is, and it leaked in the fall of 20, uh, uh, 2019, uh, late 2019. The other idea is that when DARPA turned down the Diffuse project, it went ahead in Wuhan 
either with our knowledge or without our knowledge. That's the second hypothesis. We don't know. But I'll tell you something interesting. The Democrats are working full time to stop us from knowing. They are objecting to any congressional investigation. I'm a Democrat. I used to be. I'm not part of any party anymore. I can't stand them. Uh, so, uh, but Rand Paul asked me to help him convince Democratic senators that know me that we should look into this. They will not look into this. They are blocking even an investigation, subpoenas, lab records, anything. They don't want to know. And then a very interesting story uh, about eight weeks ago. Uh, again, I've not tracked it down. I'm not following this uh, day, day to day, and I'm not privy to the House investigation that is going on under the Republican leadership. Um, but you may have seen that a CIA whistleblower came forward about six weeks ago because Biden tasked the intelligence community to look at the origin. What did the public get out of this one page? Okay, but the CIA was on the side that it was probably natural. And this whistleblower came forward and said, yeah, we were seven people. Six of us said it probably was lab. And my other five were bribed by the CIA to reverse their vote. And he made this public, and, and the committee has now called CIA officials to explain uh, the background to the CIA internal decision. DOE has said, because of Lawrence Livermore Labs, probably from a lab. And my own guess is you know, well over 90% that this is lab. Uh, maybe even significantly closer to 100%. Um, and without question, the US was deeply engaged in the research. And Fauci did not tell the truth at all from the first day about this, because from February 1 onward, they knew that this was really a possibility that this came from a lab, and they never told the truth to the public. And so this is a dreadful story, and 18 million estimated deaths since the start of this, and we don't even try to find out in the Senate. You can't get any investigation going at all. And by the way, the newspapers have been shockingly devoid of content on this. Uh, I know uh, I'll say a word about the New York Times, my erstwhile favorite newspaper, which I can't read anymore uh, on everything. But on this one, I spent hours with the reporter. They would not say one word honest about the real basic facts as we know them. And at one point, just a blank out. And then about six months ago, another New York Times reporter called me and um, I said, OK, I'm going to try again because he said, uh, you know, we want to look at the story. Uh, and so I spent an hour with him. Not a word of that afterwards. So I called another of the scientists who is deeply involved in this. And I complained. I said, I spent an hour with this guy. And he said, Jeff, I spent five hours with him yesterday and not one word. It's phony, completely phony. They've shut up this story. And it's terrible because what could be partisan about where a virus came from, for heaven's sake? And the reason it matters, the reason it matters is that there is a tremendous amount of ongoing dangerous work in laboratories around the world, completely outside of any scrutiny at all. It's shocking. There's no system. 
there's no control, there's no scrutiny, and we can do things with viruses that are terrifying, is what I have learned, and no one is paying a goddamn attention to it. But Jeff, we've gone way over our time. You're, you're an amazing uh, citizen. Thank you. And, uh, thank you very much.